Um, we're trying to move our, our to bigger venues, but it's schools in. So we can't get the high school gym or auditorium like we typically try to do. So we're going to be at Kenosha. I mean, I'm talking to people who are in, but some people couldn't make it in. We're going to be in the Mount Ground Room over in Gateway in the next one. So uh, there will be a bigger location there. So I'm trying to get bigger uh, town hall venues. We're having some complications given the um, school time we have. But it's great to see everybody. Um, let me start off with a quick PowerPoint presentation. Those of you who have been to my town halls before kind of know how I start these things. I want to go through a PowerPoint about our budget, about our fiscal problems we have today, and about uh, our plan that we've passed to try and deal with this. And then let's just open it up. And I just want to go with two ground rules if that's possible. Number one, I'm your federal representative, so let's stick with federal issues. I can't help you with your speeding tickets. I don't work in Madison, and, and I have nothing to do with the trash collection, okay? So federal issues number two, let's prove to these folks that Wisconsinites can have civil debate that we can treat each other with respect, that we can have a nice civil dialogue with one another and each other. So with that, let me just get started with this. Um, first of all, let's get into just some facts about our budget, because our budget today is a lot different than it used to be. And our budget problems, our fiscal and economic problems, are a lot deeper than they used to be. Um, let me just go through a cursory view of government spending, federal spending. The green and orange slices of the pie are what we call discretionary spending. That's 39% of the federal government. That's the money that Congress does appropriate and control every single year. That's money on government agency budgets, you know, the Pentagon, the Department of Commerce, and all of that. 39%. Remember the government shut down, the whole talk about that? That was over just this part of the government. Actually, it was over about 17% of the government. The rest of the pie the federal government, the other 61% of the current government, is what we call mandatory spending. That's spending that's on autopilot. Congress doesn't determine that spending level on any given year. If you qualify for a benefit, you get it. You know, we pay interest to our bondholders. If you're a farmer, you get, you know, farm program payments. If you're, uh, if you get injured in Iraq, you get veterans benefits. If you turn 65, you get Medicare and Social Security. Automatic entitlements that if you get it, you know, you get it. If you qualify for it, you get it. That's on autopilot. That's the fastest growth of spending. The biggest drivers of our debt going in the future are these basic entitlement programs. And it's most of the age-based ones, particularly our healthcare ones. Right now, we're right here. Social Security is the big program. It is not the biggest contributor of our debt going forward. Medicaid and Medicare grow to massive levels. They grow to the point where they have tens of trillions of dollars of unpaid promises or unfunded liabilities. And the reason these programs grow so fast to the point where just those three programs, if you throw interest on top, by 2025, they consume all federal revenues. Those three programs consume all of government's revenues in just a little over a decade with interest. The reason is basically this. When the healthcare programs were created in the 60s, men lived into their 60s, women lived into their 70s. Now men are living into their 70s, women are living into their 80s and their 90s. So it's costing more than ever was anticipated. People are living longer. That's a good thing. The other problem is, is demographics. These are pay-as-you-go programs. Current workers pay their current taxes to finance current beneficiaries. But we're doubling the amount of beneficiaries because the baby boomers are retiring. So we're going from 40 million retirees to 77 million retirees. And with a pay-as-you-go system, we got a 100% increase, basically, in the retirement population, but only a 17% increase in the tax-paying population. So that's putting tremendous pressure on these programs. The other, the third part is healthcare costs. They go up a lot faster than everything else. They go, they rise faster than our economy grows, than other prices grow. So those things are combining to really grow these programs to the point where Medicare goes insolvent in nine years, and these programs are the biggest source of our debt. Let's take a look at our debt. When you have debt, people have debt. People borrow money for houses, for cars, for businesses. Governments have debt. Um, what kind of matters is how big is your debt relative to your income, not only as a person, as a business, but also as a country, and who are you borrowing it from, uh, meaning who do you owe it to? 1970, our debt was fairly small. We owed it to 95% of ourselves. We cash flowed our own debt. We bought treasury bills as Americans, and only 5% of our debt was held by foreign countries. 1990, our debt started getting bigger. 81% of our debt was held by Americans, 19 by foreigners. Now... Our debt is a lot larger, and 47% of our debt is held by foreign uh, governments. Let me see if I can raise this thing. Sure. 
So let me see if I gotta do this. This thing's a little off. Let me see if I can raise this up. Maybe I'll get somebody to, is there in Washington, 42% of it's borrowed, and about half of that is coming from other countries. China, number one. This is not a sustainable situation. We can't keep borrowing money from other countries to cash flow our government. What happens when we do this is we lose our sovereignty. We're losing our ability to control our own destiny. And we're borrowing money from countries that don't necessarily have our best interests in mind. So this debt threat is also, a, 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 it has a lots of complications and a lot of problems to it. Now, like I said, people have had debt. Governments have had debt. We've had debt. We had a lot of debt in World War II. We borrowed as much as our entire economy was worth. As much money as all Americans made, we borrowed that plus a little bit more to win World War II. We basically sold war bonds that, that, that Americans cash flowed. And our debt got under control. And what the economists tell us is that the debt gets to about 90% of GDP, 90% of your economy, you start slowing down your economy. You start costing jobs. Well, here is what the Congressional Budget Office tells us our debt is going to become. This is where we are headed. And this is not Paul Ryan's numbers. This is from the government's own estimates. My, when my three kids are my age, we're gonna have, we're gonna basically borrow two dollars for every single dollar we make in America. That is unsustainable. You cannot give this to the next generation. It's also gonna hurt our economy right now. Because by the end of the decade, our debt is projected to go above the entire size of our economy. And so, We've got to do, deal with this. This is based on assuming low interest rates, which I don't think is a safe assumption. But if we get down this path, that means really high taxes, really high interest rates, inflation. And the, the CBO actually has a computer model. They say by the time we get right here, the economy just crashes. They, they, they literally can't conceive in which the economy goes by the year 2037 because of the debt burden. So this is something we've got to deal with. Now, I would also argue the sooner we act, the better off we are. The General Accountability Office, which is sort of the accounting arm of Congress, they do this calculation called the fiscal gap, which is sort of the cost of waiting. Two years ago in 2009, the fiscal gap was $62.9 trillion. What that means is, that is the amount of money of promises that government is making to current Americans that it doesn't have money to fund. So we owed more money to ourselves than we are all worth. As, uh, collectively as, as a country, as, as households. That means in, in 2009, we would have had to set aside $62.9 trillion. We would have just come up with $62.9 trillion, invested in treasury rates, so the government could actually finance Medicare, Social Security, <coughs> Medicaid for my mom's generation, my generation, my kids' generation, seniors, workers, children. Last year, that number jumped to $76.4 trillion. This year, it's $99.4 trillion, meaning we go over $10 trillion deeper in the hole of unfunded promises every year we fail to fix this problem. So the sooner we deal with this, the better off we're going to be. Now that's why we put out a, a plan, a, a budget, which is different than your run of the mill, every year congressional budget. And what we basically said is we've got to get ahead of this situation. We've got to get this debt under control if we want this economy to grow, if we want to have the next generation better off. There's four things we're trying to do, and I'll do this quickly. Get the economy growing to get people back to work. It's a lot better if people are going from collecting unemployment to actually collecting a paycheck and paying taxes. So we gotta have plans that get the economy growing. The social safety net is framed. We have to repair our social safety net, which I would argue we've kind of gotten consensus in this country about. We wanna have a system that catches people from slipping through the cracks, helps people when they're down on their luck, and helps people who can't help themselves. But the social safety net was really designed in the, 19, in, the, in the 20th century not to work in the 21st century. So we've got to make it adaptable to create incentives not for people to stay on welfare, but to get back into the workforce. Job training to get people off of welfare, back into jobs, becoming independent, producing in society. Fulfill the mission of health and retirement security. So that's the mission of these programs. They're going bankrupt. We've got to save them so that we can keep them going into the future so that they don't bankrupt themselves or the country. And then. Again, it's kind of cliche, but let's pay off our debt. 
Let's, let's get this debt under control and so that the next generation does not inherit our debt. We're borrowing from them. We're, we're taking from their standard of living. Let's stop that and let's get this debt paid off. So if you take a look at what we're basically proposing, the president's budget is this red line. We're proposing to bring spending back down to where it historically has been. And that cuts about $6.2 trillion in spending from the president's budget. His spending stays up at high levels and stays there in, in perpetuity. Here's what we propose on, on, on spending. Historically, our spending has been what we call 20% of GDP, 20% of our government's economy, I mean, of, of, of the U.S. economy. Government, federal government, is taking 20 cents out of every dollar made in America, on average, to pay for the federal government. Right now, it's estimated to go up and continue going. That's the current path we are on. By the time my three kids are my age, the government will be twice as large then as it is today. So instead of taking 20 cents out of every dollar to pay for the federal government, they'll be taking 40 cents out of every dollar just to pay for the federal government. Here's what we propose to do. Get it back down for its historic size and hold it there. Look at where the deficits are heading. We've had deficits in the past. We have modest surpluses. This is what the Congressional Budget Office is telling us our deficit is going to be. We are literally getting deficits that just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger based upon the path we are on. Our budget says, basically gets us on a path to balancing the budget, making some surpluses so we can pay off our debt. When you take a look at, that's really the fork of the road that we're in. If you take a look at where our debt is, here's what the Congressional Budget Office says our, our budget does. The debt peaks in two years, it never gets to that high level of 90% of our economy, and then it pays it off. It's basically a plan to, just like you're paying your mortgage, you know, your principal and your interest, to get our debt on a downward glide path to get it paid off so the next generation does not have this tidal wave of debt. Now, I'll, I want to simply conclude with one, a couple points. One of the things you, you'll hear about a lot is Medicare. As I showed you before, Medicare becomes the biggest program in the federal government. It's the biggest contributor to future debt. So it's a program that has got to be reformed if it's going to be saved and prevented from going to bankruptcy. Let me ask a question. How many of you are 55 or above? And if you're a young lady that doesn't want to answer, raise your hand, just do it. Do it. This doesn't affect you. Our plan does not change Medicare benefits for any of you who just raised your hand. We're, our conclusion is this. You've already retired. You're about to retire. These, these promises were made to you. So let's make sure that government can finance these promises and keep the program just as it is today. But for those of us, like in my generation, who are 54 and below, the program's going bankrupt. It's, it's not sustainable on its current path. So what we're basically saying is go to a system that's sustainable. And we're basically saying use it, make a system like the one I have as a congressman or federal employees. I get a book of plans from the federal government. This would be coming from Medicare. Humana, Dean, uh, Kaiser, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, regulated by Medicare that I get my benefit from. And then Medicare subsidizes the plan. And what we're saying is don't subsidize wealthy people as much as everybody else. Give lower middle income people, people with, with higher illnesses, give them more support and less for the wealthy, and give people choices. The reason we're saying it this way, and I'm talking about the 54 and below crowd, is whenever we've had choice and competition in Medicare, it's worked pretty well. The prescription drug benefit's a perfect example. When that benefit was created back in 2003, um, it was expected to cost a lot more than it ended up costing. More to the point, it came in 41% below cost projections. I mean, name me another government program that was created that came in 41% below what it was thought to have cost. Why? Because it's not a government monopoly. It's not one insurance company monopoly. It's plans competing against each other for seniors' business based on price, based on quality. If you don't like your plan, you can fire it and go with another one next year, and they know that, so they gotta compete. Get rid of the waste, get rid of the fraud, compete for people's business. So what we're saying is, just like the prescription drug benefit, not unlike Medicare Advantage, or you know, your Part D, your, your Medicare Supplemental, everybody has Medigap insurance. Those are plans that compete against each other for seniors' business. We're saying do that for the future of Medicare for 54 and below, so that we can make the program solvent. The, the alternative um, is the President's plan, which under the President's health care law, which is in law, he puts this new board in charge of Medicare called the IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, 15 people he appoints, and they decide how Medicare um, prices work. They decide how to cut costs in Medicare, and their recommendations go into place. They don't go to Congress, they just do it. 
And so, which would you rather go with? A system that does not, we, we repeal this board in our bill, by the way. We make sure that no money is taken out of Medicare to pay for this other program, which is what the President's law does. We don't think the money that is slated for Medicare should go to anywhere other than Medicare. And we don't think we should put a board of 15 people in charge of hitting arbitrary you know, spending cut targets because that's going to compromise Medicare for current seniors. Our point is this. Keep the program intact as it is now for those in and near retirement, 55 and above, but then reform it for the next generation so we can keep it intact for the current generation. At the end of the day, what this is really all about is are we going to do what we need to do to fix this country's problems, to get this debt and deficit under control? What is the source of our problem? It is spending. Spending is the red line. Green is taxes. Our taxes have been fairly consistent in that they have taken about 18 cents out of every dollar made in America throughout the last 60 years. Spending has been about 20%. That's why we've had some deficits. Spending is projected to go up through the roof. We've got to address the spending side.